All right, I know you're just as excited as I am. Time for video number five. We're about to move away from our buddy Gregor and now go beyond simple, regular Mendelian genetics because unfortunately, our boy Gregor gave us a bunch of laws and ideas that uh, there were, for example, organisms inherit an allele for each gene from each parent. Uh, some genes express and code for different proteins, and some, some forms of those alleles are actually dominant and can mask other forms. And we've been working on Punnett squares to try and understand that. But now it's time to move beyond this guy. Sorry, pal. You got us started. But unfortunately in life, real life, genetics isn't quite as simple as what you found. So with that being said, let's move into our, our first type of, if you will, weird, strange inheritance first one is something called co-dominance, and we can see the word dominant hidden in here, and this prefix co implies both. It's almost as if both alleles, both forms of an allele rather, are dominant. Now how can you have both alleles be dominant? Like in the movie Talladega Nights, you can't have two number ones, so that'd be 11. Can you have both alleles be dominant? Well, not exactly. What it's really saying is that both forms of the genes actually get expressed equally in the phenotype. In other words, one is not hidden by the other. They both show up in separate, clear, distinguishable phenotypes. Let's start with an easy example. This flower. Beautiful, isn't it? Ooh-wee. Well, obviously, as you can see in the phenotype, this has some white pigmentation and it has some pink pigmentation. Now, if we think about this, it would make sense, just like we learned from Gregor, that there must be a gene that controls flower color. And now, let's assume that it has one gene, a simple gene, that controls color. And to keep it simple, let's say a big C codes for pink, and I'll just use a little tiny C to code for white. Hmm. Now, obviously, an individual that has two big C's would clearly have to be this pink color. What about an individual who has two little C's? Hmm, well that must, clearly it's got two instructions for white. It must be white in color. But what about a heterozygous? Two different forms of that allele. The old-fashioned way we would have had, and the way we had previously learned, big C was dominant, it would have been pink. But notice here, both of these alleles show up. It's actually, they're both expressed. This guy comes out pink and white. It's almost as if they are both dominant they both show up. Kind of crazy, isn't it? Hmm. Another example, a little more realistic if we stick with animals, would appear in cattle. Notice that in, in our example here, we have a white colored big hunk of beef. This one, which is actually a, appears to be a rusty brownish red color, each of these are controlled, just as in the flowers, by a different allele. But notice in this heterozygous beast down here, both of those colorations are expressed and show up. This cattle is actually, this coloration pattern is something called a roan cattle. Also kind of strange, but kind of cool as well. Hmm, pretty interesting. Now, that's just one of these strange types of inheritance. If we move on, there's another one that's sometimes easily confused, but is different from codominance. Uh, this one being entitled, obviously, incomplete, or, n or not quite completely dominant. And just as the name implies for this one, one of the alleles is kind of dominant, not completely dominant over the other one. It's somewhat strange, it's almost as if it's trying to be dominant, but can't quite entirely mask the other allele. And it, we can use a simple example here in flowers again. Notice that one of the best ways to think of this is blending or mixing. And if we go with our flower colors again for this example, in uh, this is a famous example. They look kind of like carnations, or actually, sorry, uh, roses here, but uh, snapdragon flowers are a great example, although these are not snapdragons. Uh, but in this example, notice that for flowers that have two red alleles, obviously the flower comes out red. Flower that would have two white alleles for flower color, obviously comes out white. But notice again in heterozygotes, they have both red and white instructions, so they come out, just as if we were mixing red and white paint, they come out pink in coloration. That red is not quite fully dominant over the white. 
Anytime we get a unique new coloration like this, uh, that's a blend, that would be incomplete dominance, which again is somewhat similar to co-dominance, but yet it is different. We need to be careful and not get these guys mixed up. And just because I'm Bentley and I like to be fake, we can actually even use a fake example, aliens. <laughs> I know, I'm childish, but let's say in this species of alien, which is ugly looking, there's a gene that controls whether or not they have horns. If they have two little h, two recessive alleles, they have two horns. If they have two capital H's, different forms of the alleles, they have no horns. Now, normally, using these capital letters, we would say no horns is dominant over having two horns. However, when we mate these, Hopefully, you could do out a Punnett square and figure out that all of the kids would be heterozygous. Notice that now we get a blend. They don't have two horns because they don't have two little h's. They do not have no horns. Yes, that's a double negative. I talk real good. They actually have, they're expressing both traits, both two horns and one horn, and instead we get a blending. They come out with an in-between phenotype, one horn. Now, so far, co-dominance and incomplete dominance are pretty easy. They're pretty straightforward. The next one, multiple alleles, is a little bit different, um, but if we tackle this using just vocabulary, it's not that bad. The name, obviously, we see alleles, which are different forms of a gene. It has multiple alleles. So instead of having just two alleles, like, for example, big A, little a, we would have at least three different forms of a gene. It has more than two forms, more than two alleles. And the best example we can give is actually in us, in humans, our blood type. Now, if we look at this example here, as you may be well aware, you can have different blood types based upon proteins that are made by the cell according to genes and instructions in the DNA. We can have an A protein and be blood type A. We could have just a B protein, this antigen here dealing with that, blood type B. If you have both of them on the surface, your blood type A and B, and in this guy, as you can see, uh-oh, they don't have A or B, and they're, therefore they're designated blood type O. Any of you know which blood type you are? If you do, you might be able to make some guesses about what your parents' blood type are as well. So let's look at the genetics behind this one. What happens here, and what makes this somewhat strange, is that there's actually three different forms of this blood type gene. Now, scientists use the letter I for some reason, I'm not really sure why, to denote this gene. Now, we can have three forms here, which is kind of strange. They can have the A form of the gene. We see here this little A denoting it's the A form of the I gene. They could also have a B form of the gene. Now, these are our two alleles for this, but yet, as the name multiple alleles implies, there's actually a third form of the gene or an allele, which is recessive to both of them. We'll use a little lowercase i because this guy's recessive to both of those. That one codes for actually no proteins on the surface of the blood cell, so neither A nor B. Somewhat strange, but if we continue on with there, we can actually see that blood type A has two options. They could be homozygous, having both A alleles, or they could be heterozygous. Either one of those, because this guy is recessive, would yield blood type A. Now, along the same lines, think about what blood type B could be. They could also be homozygous for B, and obviously yield these B proteins, or they could be heterozygous with that little recessive, non-coding for, or excuse me, coding for no proteins, Either one of these code for blood type B. Now, what's weird down here, see if you can think about what showed up earlier in the video. This guy shows both A and B proteins. Just like in codominance, he would have, or she, if it's a female, would have the A form of the gene, hence the A proteins, and would have the B form of the gene, hence the B proteins. Note that this is also an example here of co-dominance. Kind of quirky. Now, stop and think for a second. What would this individual be for their genes? Blood type O. They don't have A. They don't have B. 
They only have one option. Remember, two copies of their gene. What do you think they have? Think about it. Very good. Two little recessive little I genes. They can't make the proteins at all. So notice we have these three forms of the gene, and as a result, we've got a bunch of different phenotypes here. Blood type is a fantastic example of multiple alleles. So if we keep going, another example, which we'll see on our practice problems in a moment. Oh, go ahead. Feel free, if you're watching the video right now, you can make that noise, too. Oh, bunnies. And they have a gene, as all organisms do, that controls their color. And if we say a C gene here, we'll see on our practice problem, controls their coat color. Big C could code for solid, a little c with an H, a little c with a CH, and just a little c. Oh my gosh, that's four different copies, or four different forms of this allele gene. We'll see this in our homework problems in just a moment uh, that you'll try on how to work with these. But again, notice that because we have these different alleles, we have different forms of phenotypes, which again, gives us a lot of genetic diversity as well. So that brings us to our fourth and final type of strange inheritance called polygenic inheritance or polygenic traits. Just as the name implies, it is a trait, there's our word gene, but poly, that prefix, means several. It's actually a trait controlled not by one gene, several, more than one gene, which can at first seem a little strange, but if we think about it in terms of ourselves as humans, the best examples are skin color, hair color, height, eye color, human traits. So if we look at an example of this in the figure here, we can see the P generation, a female and a male. Notice that for, in this trait, we're looking at skin color. Now, if you think about skin color, there's a wide range of skin colors, ranging from albino to very, very dark pigmentation and everything in between. Notice this infamous, just like in grades, a bell curve. A's, B's, C's, D's, and F's, and also skin pigmentation. A few people at both ends of the spectrum, and a very wide range and a high number of people towards the middle. Now, notice that instead of just a big A, little a, there are actually three genes here, an A gene, a B gene, and a C gene that control this trait. Kind of sketchy. Now, that you might be saying, well, that, that's confusing to me. Well, let's look at this one. Let's go ahead and, and uh, look a little more closely. Wow. Now, don't freak out here, but this is a Punnett square because there are actually three genes. This is a trihybrid. We'll never have to do this, but look at all the different options, all the different squares with different gene combinations and allele combinations, which yield a lot of different phenotypes. You can see someone with no pigmentation, someone with very, very dark pigmentation, and everything in between. This is massive. Now, we'll never go beyond a 4 by 4 16 squares, uh, but we wanted to throw this up there to show that polygenic traits, as we saw in the earlier video, you end up with what's called a spectrum of traits, uh, a wide variety, a wide array, skin color, hair color, height, etc. Now, this is, if we think about it, we're only going to focus on two genes at a time, but we can, the same rules apply, we can end up with a huge amount of diversity as a result. And as always, once again, in our homework problems that you'll be trying in a moment, you're going to have one of these uh, examples here as well.